with me, starting with verse 16. We're in this list of these last three, therefore, kind of statements that Paul is making. So it all has to do with what he said before. But he says, therefore, from now on, on we recognize no one according to the flesh even though we have known Christ according to the flesh yet now we know him in this way no longer therefore if anyone is in Christ he's a new creature the old things passed away behold new things have come now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And there's some great verses there. This is power packed. You can kind of see why I wanted to break this up. Every, seems like every one of these statements of Paul's is so loaded, so uh, important, so powerful. And so as I said last week, we kind of touched on this whole idea of, in verse 16 of, of not recognizing people according to the flesh. Um, I think it's a, he's, he's got a veiled reference here probably to the issues that were going on relative to the culture in Corinth. And that is, and we've talked about this repeatedly, that is it had to do with these guys who um, were influencing the church who were men of reputation you know, going all the way back, they were, they were the guys who could speak really well, the orators, the philosophers, right? We have that same issue going on in the church today, in the culture today, where we, we like attractive people. We like people who are all put together. And he, he, so I think there's a reference to that in the sense of, of how we look at one another. But he gives the... the uh, he talks about Jesus and how we, we uh, have known Jesus according to the flesh. He says, uh, we don't recognize anyone according to the flesh. In other words, we're not judging people based on the flesh, but we have known Christ according to the flesh because he's God in the flesh, right? Jesus Christ came as a man. He was revealed. He revealed God in the physical sense to humanity. And so we understand that, yet we're not thinking of those things. It's, it's one of the wonders that uh, God has so sought that there are no, you know, there's no photographs of Christ. I was actually at the Christian bookstore the other day. Uh, we were getting a, a Bible case for my wife and, and they actually have some photographs of Jesus. I was thinking, wow, how did they get that? <laughs> you know, some, some Jesus-like figure that, you know, it's like, how would you like to be that guy? Well, I did a photo shoot. I was Jesus. It's kind of weird. But we don't have that image, and we don't think of Jesus in those terms because we think of him in spiritual terms. He was revealed in the flesh, yet we're thinking about him completely different because we recognize that he's God and he's risen. And so I think... uh, you know, there's, you can look at this a couple different ways, but I think it's important for us, the lesson for us is that we're not thinking about people according to the flesh. And we're gonna get into the idea that things are changed, but as Christians, we have to fight against this. Uh, the, you know, what the culture teaches us and trains us. And we see this in Isaiah 53 of Jesus. Isaiah 53, 2, talking about him. It says that he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He had no stately form or majesty. This is Isaiah 53, 2. Uh, no stately form or, or majesty that we should look upon him nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Jesus wasn't an impressive human figure right? And, and we don't know exactly what he looked like, but according to the scriptures, he wasn't someone who you go, wow, that guy, he must be the son of God, right? We have, in, in our culture, we have superheroes, you know, and they're always impressive, 
in one way or another. They have, you know, they're, they're, they have impressive physiques and, and, and you know, they, they're attractive, whatever attractive is, right? And, and, and Jesus just, he, he's just on a whole nother level. He's not like that and we need to not think that way and we need to train ourselves not to think about others that way. We had this great lesson, if you recall, back in 1 Samuel, the whole lesson of the calling of David. If you're not familiar with that passage in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, God sent Samuel to go and anoint king, the king, the king of his choosing, which we know uh, was David. And so he sent him to, uh, to Jesse and, and to anoint one of his sons. And of course, the, the way it worked, Samuel, you know, he went there and, and they had these eight boys and they had all the boys kind of come in and, and, and Jesse was supposed to, or, uh, Samuel was supposed to figure out which one it was. You know, when the first one came in, it was like he was a handsome guy. He was tall. He was strong. It's like, and Samuel thought, surely this guy is going to be king. He looks like a king. Right? He's impressive. And then God said to him, no. The Lord said to Samuel, don't look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I've rejected him. And then we have this great line that we just love and we hang on to. He says, for God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And that's exactly what Paul has talked about. Look here in our text at, at verse 12. He says, we're not, again, commending ourselves to you, but we're giving you an occasion to be proud of us so that you'll have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. And we have to be careful as Christians to not fall into the trap that the culture has set for us, where everything is about appearance, everything is about how we look. No, God's not interested so much in that. He's interested in our heart. There's people who take pride in appearance. There's people who judge by appearance. This is a great weakness for all of us, isn't it? We find that. It's the story of, you know, you know how I met my wife or how she, actually when she tells the story, if you've ever heard my wife tell the testimony about how we met, when she saw me, when I saw her, I thought, she's hot, there's no way she could be a Christian. Because she was kind of dressed pretty racy. She had like a leather skirt on and woo. Anyway, but I was like, wow. And I'm sure somewhere along the line, I prayed, Lord, get her for me. You know, the, the prayer of Samson. Hey, Lord, get her for me. But she looked at me and thought, oh, he's kind of Richie Cunningham. <laughs> and she kind of discounted me. But, you know, you can fall into that trap where you judge a book by its cover. You have to be careful of that. As Christians, we need to recognize that way of thinking is part of the flesh. It's part of the, the world and the culture. Now, Paul moves on, having just kind of reminded us of that. We're not recognizing people according to the flesh. We're not thinking in that way anymore. And then he gives us this nugget, this incredible statement in verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, New things have come. It's a great verse, isn't it? I love that verse. Before we look at what it means to have the old things pass away and the new things come, I think it's important not to skip over the first part of this statement. He's, he's you know, it's a therefore statement, so obviously it's building on everything that he said so far. But there is this line that's really, really important for us to not miss. If anyone is in Christ, he says. And that's actually a favorite phrase of Paul's. You'll see it throughout all of his writing. He uses it over and over and over again, this term, this idea of being in Christ. And we understand, doctrinally, it has to do with being in a right relationship with Christ. We have to be, and, and all these promises and all these things, all the hope that's here, that's contained in these verses, it belongs to those who are in that right relationship, in Christ. 
It's not an arbitrary thing, it's, but it's an important thing for us to get. Jesus said it this way in John chapter three. He gave us this terminology about being born again. He was talking to a religious guy, Nicodemus. Nicodemus who came to him and he's like, he was amazed at Jesus. And Jesus confronted him and he said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He was talking to a guy who had it dialed in as far as the Jewish religion goes. And Jesus challenged him and he gave us this idea that there needed to be a rebirth. Something needed to happen. Something needed to change. We need to be born again. Now, when you're born again, then you become in Christ, right? You have this new birth, it's a spiritual birth. And it's important for us to understand this. Again, it's not an arbitrary thing. And the reason why I think it's important for us to consider it is because sometimes people feel like they're Christians and they're not. When I was in fifth grade, I had a girlfriend named PJ. You guys love stories like this, don't you? It's like, Pastor Jim is gonna humiliate himself here. No, PJ was one of my first girlfriends, you know. Serious, fifth grade crush. I think she looked a lot like Farah. <laughs> In the day, that was every fifth grader's fantasy, every fifth grade boy. And, and PJ was my girlfriend. And you know what? I don't think I ever talked to her. <laughs> it's the funniest thing. You look back in kind of a wonder years, kind of a remembrance of things. And I just remember, I don't know how she became my girlfriend, but she was my girlfriend. But we never talked. She was just, I'm sure it had to do, it was a note thing. I'm sure she checked yes somewhere along the line. I don't know if she knew she was my girlfriend, but I knew. You see, I, I just tell that story because it illustrates just kind of the point that, uh, you know, my fifth grade mind, I thought I was in this great romance. But the truth is, as an adult, you look back and just go, that was, you know, just childishness, it was funny. There was no substance to it. There was no real relationship. I never talked to her. I was, I was afraid of her. It was weird. You see, being in Christ is not an arbitrary thing. And it's not dependent upon what we say. Here's where I think our culture needs to take a lesson. Because people in our culture feel like if you say you're a Christian, you are a Christian. In fact, we see that with Islam. People say they're Muslims, therefore they're Muslim. And you can't, you can't really challenge that because people are whatever they think they are. And we could go down the road, you know, to all that that means. But the thing is, what Paul is saying is it's not dependent upon what we do or even what we say, but it's based on an actuality an actual spiritual dynamic, it's important for us to understand we need to be in Christ. Jesus said it this way in John 15, verse four. He says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. And other places, he, he went on to say, actually, he says, you have to keep abiding in me. There's this sense that if we're in Christ, if we're in this relationship with him, it's gonna be something that just continues. And it's a wonder sometimes when you see people who seem to be in Christ, they seem to be abiding with Christ and then they drift away. And we don't really know what's gone on there. And I think uh, the culture has made it even more confusing because they've co-opted the terms. Right? What is called Christian today is not necessarily people in right relationship with Christ. People are not necessarily born again. They're just cultural Christians. They say they're Christians. They might even go to church. 
I like what Keith Green said in one of his songs. Some of you older folks will know what I'm talking about. He said, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. <laughs> and yet, there are people in the culture, sometimes well-known people who claim the name of Christ but don't have a saving relationship with Christ. You know, the term evangelical. What does that mean? I call myself an evangelical. I consider myself an evangelical because I believe in the good news, which is what that means. It's the good news. It's the evangel. It is good news, the news of Christ. And nowadays, that term has been co-opted. It's a political term now, and there's a whole voting block called the evangelicals that's made up of people that includes us, maybe, but includes a whole lot of people who are not in Christ, who are just politically motivated and, and not even necessarily moral in the sense of a biblical morality. And so it's important for us to understand these terms. And I'm not going to abandon the term Christian. I'm not going to abandon evangelical. We actually need to rescue those things. Yeah. We need to have an abiding relationship with Christ. If you're here today and you have never entered into that relationship, you need to know that's important. You're not a Christian simply by birth or, hey, I was raised in a Christian family. I was born a Christian. No, you weren't. You were born a sinner. You need to have a conversion. You need to have a, a rebirth. And that happens when we put our faith and our trust in Christ. That's when we become Christians. You get born again. And so those who are in Christ, we see the things that Paul has written about previously. Verse 14, the love of Christ controls us. Right? And you can, you know, we're not, you know, not going around inspecting everyone's lives to see if, hey, is the love of Christ controlling you? But you can kind of check yourself. Is the love of Christ controlling you? You know, we look at verse 15, which was a tough verse. Actually, verses 14 and 15, we looked at those uh, previously. It's, they're tough verses, this idea that you've died with Christ. Your life is hidden with him, and he's alive and expressing himself through you. These are things that belong to those who are in Christ. And they're not just, you know, kind of religious things. It's, it's something that God does supernaturally in this rebirth and this whole concept that we have here in verse 17 of being in Christ, the new creature. We are, it says, verse 17, we are a new creature. For in Christ, we're a new creature. It's something that's recreated. You know, it's the same word all through the scriptures that talks about create, the creation of God. God is created. And, and he hasn't, it's not as though he has uh, taken the old creature and just polished it up. I think some people have a misconception about it, that somehow, that as Christians, uh, we're just, you know, we're the same people, just kind of a little shinier. Maybe we have some behavior modification or we've become moral. No, the word is very clear. We're a new creature. Something new, something that's been remade. And it's not, just, it's not just learned behavior or trying to look better. He's, he's not speaking about religion or practicing morality. In Galatians chapter 6, Paul says it this way. He says, neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. What is, he's pointing to the religion. He's saying, the religion isn't anything. The religion, the, the power of religion, even the law, he says in Romans chapter 8, is weak. It can't change people. You know, if you think back in your life before Christ, unless you came to Christ at a really young age, most of us, we can think back to, you know, some pretty bad adult behavior, some terrible behavior. Could you change that on your own? You can modify a little bit, but for the most part, no, you can't. And we've got the whole Old Testament that proves that. 
God invested in the nation. God loved the nation. Israel was the object of his affection in every way. He delivered the prophets and the word and the law and everything to them. And it's all just one big, long story of chaos and failure. And it proves one thing, that man cannot do it. We can't do this. We need a savior. We need a rebirth. What's the, old, what's the old thing that went away and what's new? Well, obviously, Christ is what's new. There's many things, and we could probably all testify one thing or another that, uh, you know, when you got saved, when you got born again, things just changed. Things just went away. Remember those days? I mean, one of the, the illustrations that I like to, 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 to bring up and, and that's really vivid to me is, was my mouth. I was one of those guys, as a young man, it was just like bombs away. I I was constantly swearing. It was just part of the culture. And I was constantly, you know, using the F word and just, uh, that's just the way I talked. Except around my mom and dad. You know, but it was just who I was. And I remember there was this one time where some friends had brought me to church and, 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 you know, I came to hear the gospel and hear this band and stuff and I was talking to my friend afterwards and I remember just talking to him and just like garbage coming out, garbage. And it was like the first time it was like, man, I talk bad because I was in the company of people who didn't talk that way and it was so stark, it was such a stark thing to me. But you know what? When I gave my life to Christ, that just changed. I mean, it just changed. And it wasn't like I was, you know, hey, I made a list of words I'm not going to use anymore. I just stopped talking that way. It was the most wonderful thing. And there's a long list of things like that. I was brand new. It was the result of a new creation. Look what's between, in in the the text here, in verse 17, uh, he is a, new creature, the old things passed away, behold, new things have come. There's that word. In between the old things passing away and the new things coming, Paul says, behold. You know, I like, sometimes it's like, you know, you just look at a particular word, it's like, what is he saying there? You know what he's saying? He's saying, look at this. Look at this. Look at this in your life. And I hope you, like I, can, can look back at your life and say, you know what? At that point, things changed in my life. Something radical happened. Behold, new things have come. You know, and it's a long list of all the things that Christ brought with him when he came into our lives. Love and compassion and concern for others. We began to think differently. Again, you know, you go back to this whole idea of being concerned what what we look like and all that. We begin to judge people differently. We're in Christ and, and we're a new creature. I love it. And it's important for us to take a long look and to consider those things and to see what God is has done. He isn't saying that things ought to be new but that they are new. We need to own that. It's one of those instances where the the present, though we don't always see it, it's a present spiritual reality. You and I are brand new, and we need to hang on to that by faith. Now, unfortunately, and you may have thought of this as I was talking even about the whole foul language thing. Unfortunately, we still have this flesh, right? We still have this flesh. Actually, it happened. I'll just confess. The reason why I was thinking about this is because I went home this week one night. Lori had texted me and said, ah, the dryer hose is off and it's ripped and na, na, na. And it's like, okay, so I'm doing that. You know, and it's not like it's easy. It goes underneath a toilet and in their little laundry room and under a sink and it's a real pain. And, and I'm working on it, and I'm sweating, and it's, it's you know, it's, uh, you know. You guys know what I'm talking about. And I raised up at one point, and there's a shelf over my head, and I'm bam! Ah! Ah! 
I did it like three times. The third time, something came out of my mouth. <laughs> Shouldn't have come out of my mouth, but it did. I know I'm the only one. I know I'm the only one. <sighs> And so there's part of this that we recognize spiritually, there's a spiritual truth here, we are new. And here's, I mean, here's the big difference. I actually recognized that what I did was wrong. And I had to repent of it. And I had to tell my wife, you know, because she heard me down there grunting and making noise and she was thinking I was mad at her. And, you know, I was like, no, I had to explain to her, honey, I'm not mad at you. I just, it was kind of, it didn't go real well. I got it done, but it didn't go real well, and I was having some trouble. Um, so some of this is something that we have to believe, but we also have to practice. We are new, and we are changed, and yet sometimes we just have to, we have to work at living that way. In Romans chapter 6, Paul says this way. He says, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Amen. We need to reckon. We need to think that way hey, that behavior doesn't belong with me anymore because of Jesus. He deals with that whole difficulty in greater detail in Romans chapter seven. We're not gonna go there. Uh, but but the, it's a present reality and we need to believe it. We, we do recognize it in some sense, but then the longer you walk with Christ, sometimes you can, you can pick up some of those old sins again and, and we have to be careful not to do that. We need to live like new creatures having nothing to do with those fleshly things and following Christ. Now, uh, look at verse 18 again. He says, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Before we talk about this idea of being an ambassador, which he presents in verse 20, uh, I want to just point out three things here in verse 18. Number one is that all of these things are things that God has given us. By his grace, God has given us all of these things. And, and you could probably go back to, you know, everything else that Paul has written, every good thing, and the gospel itself, he's given us. He's just handed to us. It's like I was thinking about my friend Andy. You can't really say, oh, he deserves this. Because he knows he doesn't. And, 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 and we recognize that, that every good thing that we have spiritually, we, don't, we haven't deserved it, we haven't earned it, and yet God has given us so much in Christ. It's his grace. It's a marvel. It all stems from him. It all comes from him. God has given us all of these things. The second thing we see here in verse 18 is that God has reconciled us to himself. What does that mean? Well, we can think of it in terms of just human relationships. You guys, you guys get in fights with people? Husbands and wives, do you ever get in fights? I know, not here. We're Christians. No, you get in fights with people. You get in arguments with people. And unless you reconcile, you're just going to be in a state of not getting along. You've got to reconcile. Right? Someone's got to give. Someone's got to repent. You've got to kiss and make up. Well, this is an accounting term, and it, and it means simply to bring the accounts kind of up to speed, to, to, to have them make sense. In my past life, I used to be a retail manager. You guys know I used to work for Bartels. And uh, there was this one time I was managing a store and uh, I was actually kind of an interim manager, and, and my whole career with them was kind of dependent on how I did at this particular store. And uh, part of the responsibility of the manager is to reconcile the books. You got to do the books. Something I hated, because I'm not a math guy. I don't like numbers. I don't, that's just not my bag. But I had to do it, and I had to learn how to do it, and I had to be good at it, and I had to be fast at it because you do this kind of stuff, you get the money out and do all that before the store opens. Well, I remember there was this one Saturday, I was working on the books and, and, and I kind of, you know, what you do is you've got the register reading and then you've got the cash and the checks and the credit card slips and you try to, it's supposed to match, right? You got all the different tills to reconcile and you got to figure, but the bottom line is you want to come out to, you know, close to zero as you can. And this particular morning, I was like $700 off. That is, I was missing $700. 
And I, I remember just breaking out in a cold sweat. Because it's like, okay, this is a big deal. I gotta find this. And I poured over, I spent the whole day going back over it and back over it. And you go into all the registers and look for $700 in cash that you missed, and all this stuff. And at the end of the day, we were just short 700 bucks. And I remember my district manager came in and you know, it was like a big deal. Now the big guns are you know, looking at me like, what'd you do with the Jacobson? You know, and I didn't know what to do. Well, we ended up figuring it out. It was a, someone ripped us off. It was a, there was a $700 money order that was sold. And so we just figured that they took their cash as well as the money order. And thankfully it wasn't a transaction I was involved in. But nonetheless, it was this idea that there was this pressure on me to reconcile. And in this case, it was something that couldn't be reconciled. The accounts didn't line up. They didn't match. And so... You know, at the end of the day, we just kind of had to figure it out the best we could and then say, okay, we're moving on. The scripture says that God reconciled us to himself. Notice, it doesn't say that we reconciled ourselves to him. He reconciled us. And it's really similar to the image of what I just painted about that Saturday morning for me. It doesn't add up. It doesn't match. Our God is holy and righteous and perfect. And you compare his righteousness, his perfection with us. And we're not reconciled apart from Christ. We are not reconciled. In fact, we're way short. The balance sheet is a mess. And yet, look at verse 19. Uh, it says that in that God in Christ reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them oh in other words this is what God does this is what God does as he considers your life again in Christ if you're not in Christ you're accountable and I'm telling you The scriptures are clear. Your life is clear. There's a serious deficit because all you have on your side of the ledger is sin. And you might think, oh, but I gave some money or I I come to church. or So what? You're a sinner. And you can't, apart from Christ, be reconciled. And so the image that Paul paints here is such a beautiful image. It's that God reconciled us. Not counting our sins against us. I mean, that's what happened on the cross. Jesus Christ paid the penalty for your sin. And that ledger sheet, that balance sheet that was totally out of whack, all of a sudden became reconciled. And for us as Christians, and that whole process of becoming a Christian, is when we look to the cross and we say, thank you, Jesus, for doing that for me. I brought nothing but sin, and you took it. By faith, you took it on the cross. It says in Romans chapter five, verses 10 and 11, it says, while we were enemies, that was the state, the the wacky balance sheet, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. It's, It's grace upon grace. We were reconciled, we were declared right, but then on top of that, God gives us life eternal life. Romans 5.11, and not only this, but we exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Filthy, rotten sinners like us declared right because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross who came and died and paid the penalty for sin that you and I might be reconciled to God. Oh, that's just the second part. In verse 18, it's all from God He's reconciled us to himself. And then, if that's not enough, it says that he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We've seen Paul, he's, he's, he's written about that uh, repeatedly. Uh, he talked about the, the uh, ministry of the Spirit in uh, chapter 3, verse 8, the ministry of righteousness in, in 3, 9. Here, he says, we have the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry You're in the ministry, Christian. 
Do you know that? Do you believe that? God has given it to you. God has called it to you. God has given to Christians the responsibility to be the messengers of this message of reconciliation. Have you ever been on a plane? You guys have all been on planes, I'm sure, and you guys know the, the procedure when they go through, you know, this thing. They tell you they do the, you know, sometimes those airline stewardesses, they, they seem like, it's like, oh, I gotta do this stupid thing. No one's paying attention to me. They show you how to unbuckle the thing, and, you know, they t- always tell you the same thing, you know, when, if the oxygen masks come down, make sure, put it on yourself first, and then you can help somebody else. That's why there's the order here. You first got to be in Christ. Having gone through this process, this transaction of becoming his, being reconciled to God, and then the next thing is he gives you this ministry of reconciliation whereby you can help others because you have this message. He's uh, committed it to us. Verse 19, again, it says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. God has given us, as Christians, this responsibility. And so we go into this whole language now. Uh, This is the responsibility that we have as Christians. It's what God has given us. It's what he's called us to. He's asked us basically to be partners of his. We've got the word you know, the word of the gospel and all that it means, it's our responsibility to share it. And so he, he now he says, we're ambassadors, verse 20. Therefore, having said all of this, having received this reconciliation, God having committed it to us, called us to it, you're ambassadors for Christ. As though, he says, as though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ to be to be reconciled to God. I love those verses. It's, it's definitely something that I think is on my heart all the time. You know it comes out when we're talking about these things. Three things uh, as we wrap up here about being an ambassador. An ambassador is a citizen of another land. An ambassador is a citizen of another land and in this case, it says in Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask yourself this question. Do you live your life as a citizen of this world or of that world? Now it's tricky, isn't it? Because we're both. But one, one should inform everything you do. And how you conduct yourself as a citizen here on earth should be informed by being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. We could talk about voting. I'm not going to go there. But certainly that's part of it. How are you conducting? How are you thinking? Who are you going to vote for? Is it informed by the kingdom of heaven? Or is it informed by the things of the world? How, How do you conduct your business as a business person on the job? How do you conduct yourself? Is your lifestyle informed by the kingdom of heaven or by the kingdom of this world? You're an ambassador. And I like, uh, here's what uh, William Barclay said, one of my favorite commentators. He said, uh, his life, this, uh, speaking of an ambassador, he says his life is spent among people who usually speak a different language who have a different tradition and who follow a different way of life. Amen to that. The Christian is always like that. He lives in the world. He takes part in the life and the work of the world, but he is a citizen of heaven to the extent that he is a stranger. The man who is not willing to be different cannot be a Christian at all. Oh, that's punchy. That's why I like to read those things in quotes because you can go, I don't like that guy. I'm just, you know, I just thought it was interesting. If you're not willing to live like a stranger, you're not really living up to this calling. You're an ambassador. You're supposed to live as a citizen from another land. 
The second thing about an ambassador is the ambassador has the responsibility to speak on, the, on behalf of his country and king. Your responsibility, and, and, I, and I would just say, it's not my responsibility only, it's our responsibility to speak. He's, he's given us this word of reconciliation. I mean, think about it. We have, this is the message from our king. This is the message from our king. God wants to be reconciled with you. You're at war with God. He wants peace. And he's provided for it. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is turn to Christ. That's the message. The message is here in verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He made Jesus Christ to pay the penalty for your sin. And if you'll trust him with your life, he'll forgive you and give you eternal life. Oh, but I don't know if I could say that, pastor. Ah. You know, we root for so many things. We promote so many things, right? We, we tell, oh, I saw this movie. You gotta hear about this great movie I saw. Oh, you gotta watch this show because it's so wonderful. Oh, I know the savior of the world. I know God. And I know how you can have a relationship with him. Oh, we're ambassadors. We have the responsibility to speak and to speak the message. Paul says, it, it, notice the passion because he understands it. He says, we beg you. I beg you. Be reconciled to God. It's so easy. All you have to do is ask him. Put your faith and your trust in Christ and receive what he has for you. Thirdly, for an ambassador, the honor of the country is in the ambassador's hands. We are representatives of the country, of heaven, of our king and his kingdom. I think this is one of those things, and I'm not, I'm not considering you guys and your life, but just as a culture, the Christian culture in general, in so many ways we're blowing this. In so many ways, we are not accurately representing our humble servant king. Who, what did he teach us to do? He taught us to love one another. He taught us to be tender-hearted and kind towards one another and, and all these wonderful things. Matthew, in, in, in Matthew 5, Jesus said it this way, it, and I think this is just a great way to close as we consider what it's like to honor the country that we come from and the, the king that we represent. Jesus said, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. I hope you are living that way. And not just in the way you live, but in the way you speak and in the manner that you conduct yourself. In all the areas of your life, you should be controlled by and reflect Jesus Christ because you're a new creature. Every day we have a challenge, don't we? Every day we have a challenge. Are we gonna live like the new creation or are we gonna live like the old rotting flesh? Are we gonna live according to the culture of heaven, according to the culture of the kingdom of heaven or are we gonna live in partnership with the culture of this world people need to see something different people need to see something that's radically different than what's in our culture let's have the worship team come back up and they're gonna lead us in one last song I just want to I love these verses I think it's so wonderful I mean just consider that God has given us this he's given us this all of this you know right relationship that we could be in Christ in a right relationship with God, reconciled to him, we bring nothing to the table. It's just a gift. And then beyond that, he's asked us, the church, to be his ambassadors, to be his representatives here on earth. It's an awesome responsibility. Can we do this? I like that answer, but the truth is we need to remember, no, we can't apart from the strength that he supplies. Our theme here in 2 Corinthians is power in weakness. Can you do it apart from Christ? No. We've got to be in him. We've got to be in that abiding relationship. 
when we're in that abiding, daily abiding relationship and letting him strengthen us, then yeah, absolutely. We can do it. Let's stand. Father, we thank you for this word. God, we thank you that you have reconciled us to yourselves. All of us who put faith in you and we count ourselves as being in Christ. Lord, we want to commit to you once again as we consider what you've called us to, as we consider this concept of being your spokesperson, your ambassadors. Lord, we need your strength. We want to represent you well in this kingdom on earth. Lord, equip us, strengthen us, fill us with your spirit. Use us, we pray. We thank you, God, for your great love for each one of us. In Jesus' name.